Hey everybody, welcome back to the vlog. So today I'm still a little bit under the weather, but that's okay. It's my birthday, so I'm happy to be here, as well as a brand new announcement from Fuji just came out, which makes me happy also. It is the X-T3. I've been talking to you guys about this for some time. I thought that it was gonna be really incredible, and looking at the specs and the announcement, it really is pretty incredible and it might be right for some of you guys. And I just wanna tell you about all the features that it has, talk to you guys about it a little bit, and then give you some of the negative sides of it too, right? There's always two sides of a coin. Nothing is perfect. There's no perfect camera, right? So let's dive into it. Now, the Fujifilm X-T3 has an APS-C 26 megapixel X-Trans sensor. They decided to go with the X-Trans in comparison to a bare array. Some people like X-Trans, some people don't. I personally like it. It's also a BSI sensor, so it is backside illuminated, so you're going to get nice, crisp images, right? Also, it now has a quad core instead of a dual core processor in it. That much more powerful processor will help with a lot of specs, as we'll see coming up. Now, it does provide weather sealing as well as being a magnesium alloy body, which is nice. Now, autofocus points. Now, autofocus points are 425. What's interesting is those 425 are across, these are phase detection, across the entire sensor, 100% coverage, which is really nice. It also has focus tracking, it's AF tracking, down to negative three EV. Now, I believe it used to be negative one EV on the X-T2, so there's an improvement there. Also, continuous shooting is 11 FPS, 11 frames per second. Now, you can switch it over into a crop mode and get all the way up to 30 frames per second, guys. 30 frames per second. That's crazy. That's basically motion picture speed, right? That is a lot of frames per second. Also, the grip that you can purchase no longer gives you more ability right? It doesn't provide you any new functionality. Like the old X-T2, if you had the grip, you would end up with more FPS. It doesn't do this anymore. If you buy a grip, the only reason you're buying it is for a greater or longer battery life, as well as stability, having something larger in your hand. I personally would not shoot this camera unless I had a grip because I like some girth behind a camera. That's just my personal opinion. Also, it has a 3.69 million dot EVF. Now, that is a, I think, 0.75 times magnification. It's near, I would say, identical to the Canon EOS R as well as the Nikon Z6 and the Z7. So that's really great. The difference is we have zero blackout with this camera. Now what they did change was the diopter. They made it lockable so you don't accidentally fiddle with the diopter and when you're looking, everything's not blurry and it's not your camera, it's your eye, right? So they made that lockable. That was a really good feature. Also, what they've now provide is what they call digital micro prism. It throws a prism in the center of your EVF and it's round. And in the prism, you see a whole bunch of squares. It's basically to emulate a 35 millimeter film camera, how the focusing system works on this, manual focus, right? You look through, now this one, instead of having squares in the prism, right, it's triangles. But what you would do is you would flatten out the triangles, you know you have your focus right. The one thing that they missed that I wish they would have put was a split down the center so that when you're looking through it, it splits everything you're looking at and when you merge the two together, you know your focus is exact. I like that. Old school. Old school just simply works. So. What is this for? Well, if you are, let's say, a wildlife shooter, if you're like shooting landscape and you wanna get your manual focus, this is for manual focus now, and you wanna get it just right, this will help out a lot, in my personal opinion. They also have put in dual card slots. We've been talking about this just over and over and over. Canon did not. Nikon did not, and the people that do, they always put one fast slot and one slow slot, you know, it just, why, 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 I, I don't even get it. So anyways, you're getting two dual UHS-2 card slots in this camera. Thank God, I don't even know. Then of course you have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and time-lapse, and of course 
USB-C. That's really great because then you can have that high speed data connection with your camera as well as internal battery charging. Really great. Now, let me get into some of the video capabilities. This is always important because we know a lot of us are hybrid shooters today and video is really important. It does have reduced rolling shutter. That's fantastic. Why? Well, they have a processor that's three times faster. It can do a lot of interpolations, a lot of um, algorithmic computations, right? So that's really great. You also have your zebra as well as focus peaking. That's really nice for being able to know what is in focus and what is not. Now, it will shoot 4K guys, 60 frames per second, not 30, my God. So it does 4K, 60 frames per second, 420 10-bit, and it will do 4K, 60 frames per second, 422 10-bit externally. That's right, 422 10-bit, but 60 frames per second externally. That's not 30 frames per second external like we see with the Canon EOS R, as well as the Z series on the Nikon side. Also, we have F-Log, so a lot of people know log is really important, especially if you need a ton of dynamic range. I think it gives you 12 stops. I don't know, it gives you a ton of dynamic range. And this gives you the possibility to be able to do your color grading after the fact. So it does provide F-log. Now, we have to get into some negatives. Negatives are important too. We need to stay balanced here, right guys? Stay balanced. Now, some of the negatives to me are battery life. It's gonna use, I believe, the same battery as the X-T2. You're gonna be going through some batteries like chiclets if you're out there in the field recording video and shooting pictures a lot. For me, it's not much of a problem because I would purchase a grip <laughs> and double or triple my battery life or whatever it is. I think you get about, I don't know, 1,000 or 1,100 shots with the grip. So the grip would definitely be on my shopping list for sure. Also, no IBIS no internal image stabilization. That is a problem to some people. That is the same issue that is going on with the Canon EOS R, but Nikon does have that in spades with their IBIS internal to the camera with their Z6 and their Z7. Next, the back panel. Why Fuji? Did you put this crap screen on the back of this camera? Why not the fully articulating back panel that you have on your X-T100, for example, a cheaper camera? Why did you do this horrible Nikon-esque Z-series flippy? I don't get that. That I don't get. To me, that is a major just negative. Now, people that don't shoot video very much, they don't need the selfie type of thing and the flip around screen. This will not be a factor at all. So. Keep that in mind. For me, that's a big issue, and I don't understand why they did it. I just really don't. Also, it does have a really great eye tracking or face detect in the camera when it comes to AF, but it does not follow your selection. So on your back panel, you can't say, okay, select this red ball, and as it bounces through the frame, follow that red ball. It doesn't follow. You have to keep on tapping it. Unlike, for example, a Canon, whereas I can say, follow my face or, you know, follow this camera, and now it will just keep following it around the frame. It does not have that. So for some people, that might be an issue. And lastly, the camera is made in China and not Japan. Some people will find this to be a major issue and they won't buy the camera because of that. But bear in mind, companies like Apple have their product made in China and everything is fine. Of course, it always comes down to QC, quality control. How good is their quality control? That is the question, right? As long as the quality control is there, it really doesn't matter who puts it together, quote unquote. But the big but here that I really, really enjoy, or I'm happy about the China made product now, is that instead of taking that lower cost at building it in China and keeping all that money for themselves, they decided to give it back to us. So instead of coming out at about $16.99, like the X-T2, I believe was, it's now coming out at $14.99. So it's now a much better camera 
at a lower cost. Kudos, kudos, kudos to Fuji. Remember guys, I've said this in the past. Fuji is unlike Canon and unlike Nikon because they care about their customer. Why do I say that? I say that because they continuously, continuously give more, provide more, listen and make corrections. If there is a problem, they will fix it in firmware. You will get firmware revisions throughout the lifespan of your camera that not only fixes problems, unlike other camera manufacturers, but also provides more functionality based on that firmware update. That is so awesome. So, so awesome. So anyways, as a full frame shooter, this being an APS-C camera, will I be purchasing it? I really think I might. Why? Well, I want to try out the new Fuji because it just is cool. It's retro and it does everything that I need it to do because I would not be using it for video. I would like to take this out in the field on trips, on vacation, and not take a big DSLR. I like having something that looks like this with all of the dials. All those manual dials are just cool to me. I like to be able to change everything up here, take the shot and call it a day. I like that retro feel, right? So that would probably be a cool travel camera for me. What about you guys? I wanna hear from you. Once again, we now have Fuji, in the mix here with, I think, just a crushing camera. I think it's amazing. I also want to say that I think Fuji might be the dark horse that just comes out there with that, wait for it, medium format rangefinder that looks like this. That's going to be sub $4,000. That will be absolutely amazing because when we see companies like Nikon with their Z7, right at $3,400. If Fuji can come out with a medium format range finder at under $4,000, it's going to crush it. It's going to crush it. Wait for it, guys. Wait for it. So I think the camera is going to be called the GFX 50R and we should see it right around the 23rd, 26th, right around photo Kina time. So that's when the announcement should be made. Keep that in mind, guys. Keep that in mind. So anyways, that is the Fuji X-T3. I want to hear from you. Is it something that you like? Do you not like it? Is it something that you want to buy? How do you think it compares to what has been coming out as of late? The Canon EOS R? Huh? <laughs> the Nikon Z series? <laughs> what do you guys think? Let me know. Anyways, as always, if you enjoy my content, please throw me a big thumbs up. That would be stellar. Don't forget to smash that subscribe button so you can get all my content when it becomes available and click the bell icon so when it is available, you will be notified of it. And finally, head over to my website, jchristina.com, where you can find all the photography tools that I've invented for you and me over the years and hopefully there's something there that you might like and if there is please pick it up and support me that's it guys I'm out of here for another vlog we'll see you in the next one many blessings <laughs>